He owes journalism. You might be zoomed out and ready to trade in your computer for an in-person meeting if you've been working from home this past year and a half. But imagine how different the pandemic would have been without the internet and the digital revolution of the past 30 plus years. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, to kick off a week looking back at our coverage of technology and social media, we're going back to two conversations more than 20 years apart about the World Wide Web. Remember that name for it? It's incredible that the internet took its very first step three months after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. In October 1969, the first digital transmission ever was sent from UCLA to the other side of California at Stanford University using a system called the ARPANET. With almost no fanfare, the internet revolution had begun. Here are two conversations that show some of where we've been since. The first is from an optimistic time in 1996 and asked the question, after the hype of the internet, what are we really left with? The second from 2019 captures some of what we've learned now that we've all had a lot more experience in this digital age. I think the web represents an explosion truly from the grassroots that none of us quite anticipated happening so quickly. None of us meaning perhaps in the academic world that I came out of, or in the, the older generation, perhaps. Maybe uh, everybody else knew that it was going to happen. But this explosion where nobody uh, gave permission, and the World Wide Web, and the pages on the web, the sites on the web, that just exploded from everywhere. This is the thing you hear about it, is that this thing is, is you know, anarchic, mm -hmm. unregulated, totally democratic. Unregulatable unregulatable. It's uh, technologically infeasible to do something as basic as determine how many computers are connected to the internet. Uh, in a situation like that, it becomes very difficult to block access from or to a specific a government's computer. nightmare then, right? Uh, they can't control it. Yeah, if you want to take that sort of, if if, if in in if this were if this were a movie starring Sly Sylvester Stallone, the internet would be the means by which the underground threw off the yoke of their oppressors. <laughs> you know, it, it 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 is in some senses a, an anarchic environment in which it is very difficult to keep track of who does what and when and how. Well, talking about the who. Let's talk about business for a second, because there is the notion, as, as Corey just referred to it, that business is somehow, hijacking is probably too strong a word, but it's getting into it in such a major way and, and maybe trying to take it over. What do you say to that, Bill? Um, yes and no. They're trying to take it over in the sense that they're trying to participate, they're trying to take advantage. A lot of them are trying to turn it into what, how things used to be, turn it back into proprietary authoritarian environments so naturally there's a lot of give and take in that way in another sense I think that they're just uh, responding to the hype they're responding to the notion that you've got to be on the web and so they're doing that much but they don't have any sense of it particularly with regard to its strategic opportunities what it means about their efficiencies their ability to serve customers in new ways and the like and so in a way they're they're not it's it's almost something that's under hyped hmm. in that they i don't believe that most businesses recognize the breadth of the opportunity there are one or two things that they're maybe excited about but they really don't see it in the way in which it's so truly a unique, qualitatively different. Okay, but we, we have heard, uh, at least, you know, when you read internet magazines and so on, you see it compared to a shopping center all the time, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, the forum of ideas that I guess you, you sort of described right. it as earlier. Uh, when they talk about it as a shopping mall, what do they mean? Um, largely what they mean is the opportunity to just hang out online and, and see product. There, There is a significantly growing sector of, of, of worldwide websites and internet services through which you can actually order product and have it FedEx to you. Um, if, if I were to invest in something, it wouldn't be in the internet, it would be in overnight delivery services because no one knows who's going to win the internet wars, but everyone knows that that if that whoever comes out, they're going to need an overnight courier. <laughs> um, How about in the, remember that Sandra Bullock movie, The Net, she orders a pizza on the internet? I mean, yeah. that, are we there yet? Well, I mean, there there was a, a demo site where you could build your pizza online. Yeah. Um, it <laughs> I gotta confess, that was pretty cool. It's, actually, yeah. they yeah. did it today yeah. at Internet World mm -hmm. uh, in a demo uh, 
one of the seminars, they did that. They literally got online, ordered the pizza, have it, had it delivered to the hotel, to the meeting room, during the time frame in which that session occurred. <laughs> You're in Toronto. Very good, very good, very good. Yeah, I, I, but I want to get back to the idea of business hijacking the net. I, I don't know that business can hijack the net. I think, um, I think back because to... Because it's too unregulated? Well, I think that, that what's happening is something not dissimilar to what happened when Alexander Graham Bell built the telephone. Um, you, you, had this, you had this system that was essentially a hobbyist meeting. It was a high-tech thing. Business wasn't sure whether or not it was going to work. I've read uh, articles um, written by doctors, letters written by doctors to, to other doctors saying, well, I won't get one of these telephones in there because if I do, you know that they're just going to call me at home mm -hmm. um, and, and so on and so forth. And what happened was business, little by little, dribs and drabs, built the infrastructure on which now you get this thriving culture of not just the mundane, hi mom, I'm going to be late for dinner, but the, the desperately weird all the way from, from crank callers to um, you know that guy who ran the public confession line in New York where he had a, 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 just a number on a billboard, well, yeah, you could call it me, and leave a message. Let me invite Bill to challenge you on something here mm -hmm. because you say the mundane, honey, I'm going to be late for, for uh, coming home for dinner. Mm -hmm. But is it not true that you believe that the most significant area for growth or, or the most important tool that the Internet still represents is email, just simply electronic mail? I do. I, I, today I believe that email, in terms of its value for communications around the globe, uh, from every perspective, from an inter Internet, from an intranet perspective, and even from a perspective that nobody really talks about, uh, I know a company, a very large movie company in the United States, that has set up a website that is not linked to anything else, but it gives the address, the URL of this website, to its customers who have to download very large video files, audio files, other kinds of things, and it is such a revolutionary cost savings device for that company in terms of its customer base that it's doing something that uh, it never dreamed it could do before. It can serve its customers better and save money doing it. So that kind of uh, opportunity is truly revolutionary from a business perspective. It comes out, I think, of the efficiency that email represents in terms of communication. They're just building on it. In, in large part, I agree with Corey. The internet is not going to be uh, taken over by the business community. For one thing, the business community ain't what it used to be. <laughs> Everybody, in a sense, is a business person mm -hmm. now, or potentially so. Mm -hmm. It's really changing. Okay, regulation. Let's get back onto this, because um, I gather one of the reasons everybody wants to get into regulation, or I should say governments anyway, uh, is uh, <laughs> porn. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of smut on the Internet, as, as anybody who surfs knows. Uh, we saw recently that the German government cut off access to 200 CompuServe users because they were concerned about the kind of smut that was going over the Internet. Can anything be done about this? Should, should internet companies start to regulate themselves to, to prevent government uh, from, from getting in? Where, where are you on that, Corey? I, uh, technically, I don't think that it's particularly feasible. Uh, at this stage in the game, there is, um, you have to understand that information on the internet flows in a packet. And a packet, think of a pneumatic tube and at the front of, and, and th traveling through it messages from one, one department to another. And at the front of it you've got an address and at the back of it you've got something that tells you what was just inside it. In the middle you've got the message itself. You'd have to open every single one of those packets and examine them. It's a, it's a, it's a task beyond the task of listening to every conversation going on at the, at the Big Bell Switching Center. It's, it, it is equivalent instead to listening to uh, tiny little samples, like half-second samples of every conversation going on in Canada right now on the phones, and then piecing them together and trying to determine proactively whether any of them constitute pornography. Okay. And, and You're saying technically it can't be done, but that doesn't mean that the cries for having it being done are not going to be there. And well, in fact, they are, aren't they? I, I believe that if we could do it, we should stamp out cold weather in Toronto, too. <laughs> uh, I'd very much yeah. like to be able to ride my bike through a warm spring night home tonight. I, but you can't do it, so don't make the effort. I, I, think, I think that Corey's got an excellent point, and actually it represents a business opportunity, because what can't be regulated can be sold in the sense of options and services, filtering and the like, so that individuals, families, businesses, organizations, communities, they can buy or attempt to get technology companies to help them create environments that they can control in their own microcosm, so talking, if you will. Kind of like a V-chip for Internet. Is, uh, 
Have I got that right? Are you kind of thinking of that? Not you know the way that parents can block out violent programming for their kids. Well, I, I suppose conceptually it's yeah, like that. Yeah, conceptually. Yeah, okay. but it's it's something that really is a way of allowing people to do what they need to do individually and so forth mm -hmm. without trying to do quote unquote political regulation. You leave it completely free and let it be what various people want it to be. In a sense, you let it get controlled from the mm -hmm. endpoints okay. rather than centrally. Now, I know porn gets a lot of the attention, but the fact is, I gather, and again, reading magazines of uh, written articles written by Internet users, they say that security of their messages is the number one issue for them and not the fact that porn is flying through the, do you say air? Not air. Ether. Ether, okay. <laughs> what about security? What can be done about that? Um, Again, you're getting into an issue of uh, what one person can build, another person can break. Um, and largely on the internet, the technologies that exist are technologies that are being hacked together in people's basements and maybe being hacked together in several people's basements uh, through the miracle of the internet. Some of them are in Singapore and some of them are in Toronto and some of them are in, in Tokyo and some of them are in New York. But nevertheless, these are things that, that just guys are putting together. And then they turn around and they sell it to someone else who makes an IPO 12 months later. I mean, this is, this is an, an, an initial public offering. They, oh, they, okay. they go public they go with public. it. I see. Um, this, is, this is the nature of, of the standards on which the internet are built is they're typically arrived at through a process of sort of wild ass consensus. <laughs> so and unregulatable and never secure. Well, never if, totally secure. If, if someone can build it, yeah. someone else can break it. And yeah. if the experts are just basement hackers, yeah. then, then where do you get your real expertise? But, but remember that nothing is absolutely secure. And the issue about the internet, in a sense, is about our perceptions and our beliefs. What we believe is what we'll see. And the fact of the matter is, banks are secure in our belief system, and therefore they're secure enough that we put money there. But in fact, banks get robbed. Yeah. There's white collar crime in banks and all other places. So it's a matter of degree, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And then in fact, the internet can be as relatively secure as other environments that we trust and that we believe in. Guys, I've got 10 seconds left. <laughs> Why is the thing so damn slow? <laughs> Bandwidth, not enough bandwidth. bandwidth more backhaul. Bandwidth. Tell Ted Rogers that we all need more backhaul. That's, all what, that's always what I hear. Bandwidth, bandwidth. Okay. Bill Washburn, Corey Doctor, good of you to spend some time with us. Uh, thanks much. Enjoy your time here in Toronto and safe back to Connecticut when Thank you go you. back. Thank you. Thank you a lot. First person we heard from in that clip was Bill Washburn of Meckler Media, but I think the other guy sure looked a lot like what Corey Doctor might have looked like when he was about 12 years old. Um, Corey, how much do you agree with your former self? You know, I would, I would, uh, in the spirit of uh, the creative arts here, I would give my my former self a yes and, and that and would be that in addition to being the means by which people organize movements for liberation, it's also the means by which those they organize against create the counter revolution, um, and, and I. Th I'd like to think that back then I was cognizant of that too. I mean, people don't get worked up about the future of the internet if they think it's just going to automatically be great. So uh, I, I think that there were many of us who were both excited about the possible future, but also terrified about how it could go wrong. Do you think there actually was a time when the internet resembled the kind of naive and charming aspirations that the you know original users had in mind? Yeah, I think that was actually the situation that obtained until pretty recently and that there are still lots of pockets of it. But, you know, the the transformation of the web especially, but the Internet more broadly from a place with low barriers to entry and lots of little niches where people could just pop up and, and try their own thing. And it was all rough hewn and and very homespun and charming to just like five giant websites filled with screenshots from the other four. That was, uh, I, I don't think it was an accident. I think that, you know, we undertook a bunch of policies that, whose de facto outcome was to encourage market concentration and not just in the internet. You know, I'm sitting here wearing glasses. My glasses along with your glasses and basically every other pair of glasses you've seen in the last five years are made by companies owned by one company called Luxottica that bought them all with, with private equity money, along with every major eyewear retailer and the largest eyewear insurer and the largest eyewear uh, lens manufacturer. You know, pro wrestling is down from 30 leagues to one league. Automotive is down from dozens of companies to three. I mean, this is the trend around all industries. 
And I think that it's, although tech has had a role in that, I think um, it's a form of tech exceptionalism to say that the way that we got to this concentrated kind of plutocratic moment was because of the web and not that the web is yet another casualty of our concentrated plutocratic moment. Ramona, you wanted to add? Uh, I I, I would, I mean, I'm boring response, but I, I would I would be totally in agreement. You're in screaming agreement here. In screaming agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, um, you know, I, my interest in tech, in the digital world, very much came from a place of possibility and utopian and this belief that fundamentally as humans we want, uh, that we're very creative and that we want to be part of a collective and that the web was this space that enabled all of those things. And to this day, still, you know, you can learn how to fix the cabinet. You can learn how to make your IKEA furniture into anything other than what it was supposed to be. You can learn how to, uh, you know, decorate anything from cookies to your home, there's so many opportunities to learn and to be creative and to and to gather. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the, those initial promises are still there, but there is this, uh, the, there are these uh, gates, you know, mm. these sort of gated communities of, you know, the big tech companies that have arisen and make a lot of money in the process. And I think that's where a lot of the, the, the concern has arisen. Well, I wonder whether, uh, I wonder how many people out there thought that maybe uh, overthrowing oppressive governments might also be on the list of mm -hmm. possibilities for the internet. And to that end, I want to read something here that Jesse Hempel has written in Wired magazine, which of course covers this landscape. And uh, here's what she wrote, and then we'll come back and chat. Meanwhile, militants have harnessed the same technology to organize attacks and recruit converts catapulting the world into instability. Instead of new, robust democracies, we have a global challenge with no obvious solution. The Arab Spring carried the promise that social media and the internet were going to unleash a new wave of positive social change. But liberty isn't the only end toward which these tools can be turned. Can I get you on that, Jacob? How disappointing for you that that that, that aspect of the internet's possibilities have really not transpired maybe as much as many people had hoped. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're growing up in Southern California and Silicon Valley and there's rule of law and there's a justice system and there's, you know, generally things are well run and there's water and sewer and all those great things, then we don't really think, I think a lot of the people that created the internet weren't even really thinking about, you know, what the internet could do in places where there are none of those things, right? And you know, the internet is a tool, you, you know, you said that, and I think it's a really good point. You know, a hammer can be used to build a house or it can be used to bludgeon someone to death. And so what we're seeing here is a tool being applied in dramatically different ways by different people to achieve their own ends, whether that's terrorist groups or, uh, you know, totalitarian states or, you know, people doing tremendous good in the world. Corey, how close to those ideals and aspirations do you think the internet has enabled people to become? Well, I, th I think that what the internet is really good for, uh, both for commercial entities and for political movements, good and bad, is finding people, right? The reason advertisers like the internet is because if you want to like sell a refrigerator, that's a really hard thing to do because the median person buys like one or fewer refrigerators in their life. And so anything that can help you target someone who might be buying a refrigerator, like a history of searching for kitchen renos, that's a, that's a, a godsend for you. By the same token, if you think Black Lives Matter, it's a way to find other people who think Black Lives Matter. If you think non-binary gender, gender identities are, are meaningful, it's a way to help you find those. And if you're a Nazi who wants to march through Charlottesville with a tiki torch, it helps you find those. Hmm. And so I think the question we need to ask when we say, well, there's militant movements and there's antisocial movements and conspiratorial movements connecting through the internet, is why is it that so many people find militant, antisocial, conspiratorial beliefs so easy to believe in. And that takes me just back to oligarchy, right? Like if you scratch an anti-vaxxer, you'll find someone who knows an awful lot about things like the opioid epidemic and the role of people like the Sacklers in engineering it with complicity from their regulators. Like I think the rise in conspiratorial belief is the intersection of a rise of actual conspiracies, right? Rich people getting together to conspire to screw the rest of us over by sowing doubt about climate or you know, covering up their uh, aviation problems with the Boeing 737 or whatnot, and the ability of the internet to find people for whom the terror of knowing that you live in a world 
where the things that we assume to be bedrocks, like that our planes won't fall out of the sky because they're well regulated, makes them susceptible to other conspiratorial explanations for other things. And yeah, if they couldn't find each other, it would slow down the contagion. But the susceptibility, I think, is the outflow of a general breakdown in the institutions that we used to create like legitimate, truthful bases to proceed, whether that's in medicine or aviation or any other field. Hmm. I want to talk a bit about the toxicity, the toxic stew that so many of us find ourselves in on a daily basis here. I suspect many of the people watching this program right now will have heard of characters by the name of Borat or Ali G. Uh, these are, of course, out of the very brilliant mind of a comedian named Sasha Baron Cohen. And um, I don't know if you, well, I was going to say, uh, 1.4 million people have gone onto YouTube and watched this guy give a half hour speech where he's not making any jokes at all. He's being dead serious about um, the state of things and where the internet has taken us. Let's play a little snippet from that speech and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Conspiracy theories once confined to the fringe are going mainstream. It's as if the age of reason, the era of evidential argument is ending and now knowledge is increasingly delegitimized and scientific consensus is dismissed. Democracy, which depends on shared truths, is in retreat and autocracy, which depends on shared lies, is on the march. All this hate and violence is being facilitated by a handful of internet companies that amount to the greatest propaganda machine in history. This can't possibly be what the creators of the internet had in mind. I believe that it's time for a fundamental rethink of social media and how it spreads hate, conspiracies and lies. That is pretty intense stuff and let's get into that. Jacob, uh, are you with him or against him on that? Yeah, I think he's totally right. And one of the things that's happened kind of slowly, like a boiling frog, is that the internet has become pay to play. So these big companies are still entirely dependent on advertising for their primary revenue stream. And they need to show quarterly results to increase that revenue, revenue stream. So there's churn, they need that churn. They are really dependent on a single point of revenue and if you look at the above the fold on Google, you know, six years ago, there were still unpaid search results on it. But you go any valuable place on the Internet right now and it's all paid. So you effectively have a two tier Internet that's been created. And I think it's hugely problematic for people who have, uh, you know, less money to pay to get their views up to the top of the pecking order. Corey he called it the biggest propaganda machine of all time. Is he right? Well, I think he's right in, in diagnosing that there's a problem. And I, I think, you know, you can spot the problem from orbit. But I think when you actually dig into the nuance of what he says, there's a lot that's pretty troubling in there. Like, part of his remedy is that you could ask the, um, the Anti-Defamation League to uh, tell you what is and isn't hate speech. He says, hate speech isn't hard to classify. The ADL could tell you what it is. Well. I'm a Jew and I believe in the boycott, divest and sanctions movement and the ADL calls that hate speech. So the idea that we would take a legitimate form of political disagreement, one that in fact has a number of proponents in Israel including major opposition parties and say that those words may no longer be uttered on the internet because we found the NGO that we trust to be the arbiter of, of, of good and bad speech, I think is not just reductionist, I think it's, it's actually ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I think that what he's talking about fundamentally is the creation of kind of state-regulated monopolies, that, that the way to cure Facebook is to make Facebook kind of the eternal ruler of our online social spaces, but then demand that it kind of suffer itself to be draped in golden chains, uh, limiting its conduct, you know, insisting that it buy in huge boiler rooms full of moderators that would somehow know what was and wasn't hate speech. And the reason that Facebook can't address harassment isn't merely because the ordinary mediocrities who run that company are not suitable to decide what is and isn't viable for people to say and think for 2.5 billion people in 150 countries around the world. It's because no one is, right? There, there isn't the one group or the group of groups or the council of groups that we could convene that would be able to make those calls well 
Um, those are hard for judges to make. They're going to be very, very hard for corporations to make. I think if we want to make Facebook's dumb mistakes less consequential, we have to make Facebook less consequential. We have to make it possible for people to be in the discourse without having to, you know, make themselves subject to Mark Zuckerberg's jurisdiction because, you know, he's not going to get it right, nor will any of his successors, nor will any of his competitors. Look, getting back to what Corey was saying earlier, I think we've been through this before. The last major human revolution was the energy revolution, and it created oligarchs like Standard Oil and the Rockefellers and the Carnegies. And these people uh, had a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of money in a very short period of time. And they weren't necessarily intending things to be bad. They were delivering light and gasoline and railroads. But what happened was they just accumulated so much power so fast that the whole system got out of whack. And the response was people like Roosevelt and unionization and regula regulation, like the EPA got created because rivers started catching on fire. And people were like, what the hell is going on with rivers catching on fire? We need an EPA. And I feel like that's where we're at right now. Well, uh, Corey, I suspect Ramona's right in as much as th there's something about making rules over something that we've just enjoyed using any way we want for the last many decades uh, that kind of rubs us the wrong way. Hmm. But, but do you think something's got to be done? I know we talked 24 years ago in this studio about this thing being unregulatable, but is it time for some kind of regulatory authority to bring its wisdom to bear here? Yeah, I'm actually all for uh, some regulatory interventions here. Like, you know, I would be, I would fully support rules that required Facebook and the other big tech platforms to uh, allow competitors, whether they be nonprofit, for profit, state or private, to interoperate with them so that users wouldn't be stuck in a walled garden. I'd also like to see just the traditional contours of antitrust applied. You know, we talk about Facebook and the other companies as though they had grown through network effects or first mover advantages. When you look closely, mostly what they did was just bought all their competitors, which is something that was illegal until the Reagan and Thatcher years. You know, Google's a company that's only made yeah. one and a half successful products, right? They made a great search engine and a pretty good Hotmail clone. Everything else is something that they bought and everything they did in-house like Sidewalk Labs has been a flop. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, how we saw social media over the past decade from a great force for democracy to one of its greatest threats. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO. I'm for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.